I think um, this history, and this is difficult history, it is difficult, um, but I think it does shape who we are as a country. And what I love about her family story is that this book is really um, an exploration of American history through the lens of a family. And I think it tells us a lot about who we are as Americans. This is the Miller Center Forum. From the University of Virginia, I'm Doug Blackman. The politicians who seek the White House have always relied on stories of their humble beginnings as part of why we should support them. Bill Clinton was the boy from hope with a struggling single mother. This year's Republican vice presidential candidate, Paul Ryan, is the boy from Janesville, Wisconsin, with a struggling mother. But the election of 2012 has taken political ancestry worship to new heights. In addition to taxes, the deficit, health care, the war on terror, there has been a unique new thread of conversation in the political season about genealogy, with more import placed on the distant ancestry of presidential candidates than I would venture ever before. The Mormon upbringing and background over many generations of Mitt Romney has been extensively explored. The candidate himself has often cited his father's birth in Mexico. Barack Obama's biracial lineage and ancestry in Africa has been extensively revealed and explored, first by the president himself and later by journalists. The shared conclusion of all this family narrative is that we have two candidates whose backgrounds are fundamentally atypical of most Americans. Who would have ever imagined a presidential contest in which not just one major party nominee, but both major party nominees were the grandsons of polygamists? <laughs> <laughs> Rachel Swarns is a reporter at the New York Times who has covered for the Times Russia, Cuba, she was bureau chief in South Africa. She covered both the 2004 and 2008 presidential campaigns and the first lady, Michelle Obama, in the first year of the Obama administration in the White House. Now she has written a book called American Tapestry, which is a decidedly apolitical volume. There is nothing in its pages about Medicare or Social Security or a system of national health care or the Tea Party. And there is very little about Michelle Obama as an individual. Instead, it is a detailed portrait of the complex and far-flung ancestry of the First Lady. But this is a fundamentally American family story, unlike the stories of the two nominees one with parallels to the backgrounds of tens of millions of Americans, both black and white. It is a roadmap that almost all of us could follow to untangle our own histories. And the story of a journey down that path by living relatives of Mrs. Obama, both black and white. Rachel, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much. In the course of writing this book, you never actually interviewed the First Lady. That's right. Tell us why that was, and, uh, and then along with that, uh, the journey of the writing of American Tapestry. The First Lady, sadly, for those of us who write about her, in, in, at least in book form, has a policy of not doing book interviews. So that's, that's the tragedy for us. Um, but her family, her relatives, um, shared their stories with me, their photos with me. Um, and I used that as well as, you know, digging back into the records, into the 19th century and a little back into the 18th century. And, this, and the book began with a story that you wrote in the Times uh, after the election of President Obama. Tell us a little bit about that story, but also uh, maybe tell us the story of Melvinia and the, 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 the essence of, uh, uh, of Michelle Obama's genealogy. The story that um, started this process for me uh, was published in October of the first year that the Obamas were in the White House. And it was about the First Lady's great, great, great grandmother, whose name was Melvinia. She was a slave girl valued at $475 in 1852. And the story also dealt with the First Lady's great, great, great grandfather, who was a white man whose identity was a mystery. And after the story ran on the front page of the New York Times, there was a lot of interest. And a publisher got in touch and said, wouldn't you like to explore the rest of her family tree? And so really, it takes her family, her grandparents, and their parents and grandparents back as far as I can take them. 
Now, I'm struck by, in the reading of the book, uh, and, and you tell the many strands of, of Mrs. Obama's uh, ancestry, uh, both white and black, and the, uh, it is a reminder of, uh, of the degree to which that uh, we, we operate under the impression that we inherit our histories, but in reality, most of us select our histories. Uh, we pick which of our 38 or 36 great, 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 great grandparents uh, is our story. Uh, and you also uh, broke away from the convention of, the typical convention of patriarchal history, where most people think of their family history as being defined by the patriarchal line that they descend from. You tell the stories of all of, all of these various strands, uh, which, which I think is what makes it American. American tapestry, um, uh, this collection of, of all these stories. But which of those histories is the one that Mrs. Obama, at this stage, do you think most associates with? You know, the First Lady has described herself as, um, you know, having the bloodlines of slaves and slave owners, and that she recognizes all of that. A lot of this history, frankly, was new to her and to her family. Her ancestors included African Americans who toiled on vast uh, rice plantations in South Carolina and on smaller farms in Georgia. They were mixed race people who were free for decades before the Civil War. And they were Irish Americans who nurtured their dreams in a new land and fought for the Confederacy. The First Lady always suspected that she had white ancestry, as a lot of African Americans do, but she had no idea when or where or how these people fit into her family tree and her family story. Tell us the story of, of one of those strands. Take Melvinia and, uh, and, and bring the descent down uh, to, to Mrs. Obama. Melvinia's story is fascinating. This is her mother's line, and, and this is where uh, we were able to decisively show where the white ancestry was in her family. As I mentioned, she was um, a slave girl in, actually in South Carolina. And as a child, her owner died, and she was sent off uh, to his daughter's farm in Georgia when she was about eight years old. And she first appears in a will in the 1850s, and that's a very lucky thing because African Americans, um, as you may or may not know, uh, before the Civil War, it's very hard to find, find them. And she actually appears by name, which uh, makes people think that perhaps she was, um, the family was fond of her. But she was shipped off as a child to this farm in Georgia. Um, and she grew up there, and sometime around 1859, 1861, she gave birth to a biracial son whose name was Dolphus Shields. And he ended up moving from Georgia to Birmingham, where he moved the family from, you know, a farming family, sharecropping family, into uh, the working class. He was a carpenter who owned his own home, who founded two churches there that stand today. Um, his grandchild ended up moving uh, to Chicago, and that was the First Lady's grandfather. Now, the, that particular line uh, of, of, of Mrs. Obama's family, uh, and another one as well, though not, as er not quite as early, but on more than one front, uh, Mrs. Obama's family arrived in the North, and, in the, and specifically in Chicago, at a very early date. Very early. Surprisingly early for an African American. Talk about that and the significance of that. You know, we know about the Great Migration, which brought so many African Americans north. But her family came north ex extraordinarily early. The First Lady describes herself as a South Side girl. But on her father's side, she had no idea that her great-great-grandmother arrived in Illinois sometime in the 1860s. And her great-grandmother, Phoebe, ended up seeing the skyscrapers of Chicago sometime around 1908. Very, very early migrants. And there is talk about, historians talk about this early stream of migration as um, kind of the movement of a talented tenth of people who had a little more education, perhaps, um, who were looking for something. Phoebe, for instance, traveled to about four cities in her 20s. You know, um, she was someone who didn't want to live a sharecropper's daughter's life. And in the 1860s, though, just as a reminder, I mean, there are almost no African Americans in a place like Chicago. That's right. And this great-great-grandmother and great-great-grandfather arrived actually in southern Illinois along the border with Kentucky. And it was a very, um, you know, it was Illinois was the promised land during slavery. And her family has these stories of this family escaping slavery and, and coming to Illinois. But there were very few African Americans there at the time, very few. Mm 
and then later uh, some of these some of these early generations who move uh, who, who move in that direction uh, are essentially you believe um, uh, that the racial hostilities and sort of a deteriorating environment in Illinois and Missouri uh, forces them to uproot and move yet again further That's north. That's right, and even. She had family all over the South, so she had family in North Carolina, too, and they went to Baltimore around that time, and there really was a sense as kind of the doors were closing in terms of voting rights and opportunity that they, as many other people did, could find a better life someplace else. One thing that's striking to me uh, in reading your research is that a figure like Melvinia, uh, it, the, who was born in slavery, has a child in slavery, um, uh, and so, so is not a uh, not not someone who. The, typically, when we read about the last generation of the surviving slaves, um, uh, they were born in the in the 1860s or you know, these last. But Melvinia go, goes back into slavery and then lives until 1936. Is 1938. It? 38. My mother was and born the, in 1940. Yeah, and that was a remarkable thing because I was actually able to find people who knew her. That's and it's astonishing if you think she was born in 1844. And at least when I started the research, I was able to find two people who knew her, and she lived a long life, and they lived a long life. And so uh, the woman who married her grandson and lived with her during the last years of her life, um, and she became a midwife, Melvinia. She brought into the world uh, a man who became her neighbor. And so I actually held the hands of a woman who held Melvinia in her arms when uh, Melvinia was dying. And I think we often think of this chapter of our history as, you know, so long ago, and it is long ago. Um, but when you're talking to someone who knew someone like that, you realize it's not that far. Yeah, the nearness in time. Yeah. Um, but what is the significance of that? The, I mean, in terms of, and you must be asked this question, uh, that uh, this is all interesting at a, at a certain level, it's a curiosity level for sure. Uh, but what's the substance of knowing that, of knowing about Movinia, uh, a person that Michelle Obama uh, certainly never met, um, never got any advice from, uh, never really knew anything about, uh, and did not in any direct way inform Michelle Obama's life or President Obama's life. Uh, so what's the, what's the significance of resurrecting her from history? I think um, this history, and this is difficult history, uh, we don't know um, what the circumstances were of the birth of Melvinia's son, whether she was raped or not, as often happened during slavery. Um, but it it is difficult, and sometimes people would prefer not to, um, but I think it does shape who we are as a country. And what I love about her family story is that this book is really um, an exploration of American history through the lens of a family. And I think it tells us a lot about who we are as Americans. We'll go with that a little further, because I was very intrigued by that, uh, and you'll have to identify the individuals and the specific relationship, uh, but in the book, you, we have the story of, a, uh, of one set of, of, uh, of, a, of a black soldier during the Civil War, who's actually, I think, a, not a blood relative, but a stepfather to a blood relative, uh, but who goes off and joins the Union Army and fights uh, in important engagements and uh, is uh, promoted, becomes an officer, you know, is, is covered with glory in his own way. Uh, and not long after that, you have a group of white relatives who also become involved uh, in the fighting around Atlanta, I think. Uh, and so you have in the, in the same family, the same black family, white Confederates and black uh, Federals. Uh, but, but tell that story of, of those people and, the, and, and how you see that as it fits into the stories of all the rest of us. So uh, the uh, Phoebe, the one who arrived in Chicago in 1908, her stepfather, his name was Jerry Souter, and he escaped from slavery and joined the Union Army. And he was a remarkable man. He, um, he traveled widely himself, as he mentioned, fought in some notable engagements in the war, um, ended up in the census owning land and property, um, and uh, really rescued, actually, Phoebe's family and at, at a very difficult time. And her family, the First Lady's family, even had memories of him, and he, so much so that they said, oh my goodness, that guy, Jerry Souter, he lost his leg in the war. And I thought, oh wow, what a great story. And I went back to the archives and dug up his Civil War record, and there was his middle medical record, and there was Jerry with both legs intact. <laughs> <laughs> But he was the kind of guy who you could understand why that kind of story would emerge about him. Um, on um, the other side of the family, she had these Irish Americans who lived in Georgia who fought in the Confederacy. And um, 
you know, you, you have these two storylines and they are both part of her family story. One of her um, white ancestors died um, during the Civil War of Disease and it was an enormously difficult time for the White Shields family in Georgia. But none of uh, Mrs. Obama's relatives, so far as you know, um, had any particular awareness of, the, of, of any of the lines on the other side of, 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 of race. I mean, were there blacks who were at any point in more, you know, since immediately after the Civil War, is there any point in time where there are African Americans who have an awareness of their white relatives or vice versa? There's um, an intrigue, there are hints of it. There's an intriguing um, question anyway. Uh, Dolphus Shields, I mentioned, moved, to, uh, moved from Georgia to Birmingham. And um, his white half-brother moved there also. They lived there around the same time. At one point, Adolphus Shields had a carpentry shop, and um, his white half-brother lived not far from there. Uh, a woman who was raised by Adolphus told me that uh, he told her uh, that he had a white visitor, which was very unusual at the time, and that this was his brother. Now, whether that is true or not, you know, I don't know. Um, but she said there was only one white man who came to Dolphus's funeral, and that that was this brother. So whether or not they, um, you know, this really was that half-brother, we don't know. And part of the difficulty in this is that there was a great deal of silence on this subject, uh, both on both the black side and white side of the family. People didn't share stories, uh, the African Americans didn't share stories of their time in slavery. The people who knew Melvinia, who wondered, they knew she was born into slavery, she had these two sons who were very fair-skinned, she was not. Um, they thought that that's probably what the situation was, but she never spoke of it. And the descendants of the uh, white slave owners had no idea, many of them, that they even had slave owners in their family trees. They just, these were struggling, the sh white shields were struggling people who ended up inheriting slaves. Um, the first lady's uh, great, 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 great grandfather uh, married well. He married the daughter of a wealthy man. And when he died, Melvinia ended up going to him. But they didn't talk about it either. It's interesting that you say that because there is a, a, almost a caricature of African Americans as being obsessed with the story of slavery and that uh, it's often said that uh, African Americans want to keep talking about it and why do they have to keep talking about it um, and, the, and the, the suggestion being that this is the basis of grievances that people want to keep alive today. But in reality, uh, what your research shows is that, uh, that, that in fact, African Americans you know, desperately didn't want to talk no, about I all this. I think, in fact, it was hard, made my research harder. And, you know, the First Lady's ancestors said, and ancestors, I'm sorry, her, her living relatives, her aunts and uncles said, you know, we, we tried to ask the older people in our family, what, what do you know? You know, we have this racial mixing in our family. What do you know about that? What do you know about slavery? And people wouldn't talk about it. And I think there was this sense of uh, moving forward, of not looking back, of just trying to move forward and of not burdening the next generation with a painful period. And um, it was, I encountered this kind of silence over and over and over again. And when you identified uh, whites who were related, uh, who descended from these, these slave-owning families and such, uh, what sorts of reception did you receive? I suspected that um, Melvinia's, um, the man who fathered Melvinia's child was a member of her owner's family. And so I traced those folks. And, uh, it was an, a range of reactions, as you might imagine. If someone were to knock on your door and say, by the way, <laughs> I think your family might have owned the first lady's family. That's a bit of an unsettling um, way to have a connection to the White House. So, so some, of, some of them didn't want to talk about it at all. And I wanted nothing to do with me, nothing to do with the book, nothing at all. Um, there were some who were willing to share what they knew, and they did know a little bit um, of their family stories, of the records they have, but didn't want their names anywhere near anything. They were afraid of being vilified or having to atone for their ancestors in some way. And then there were some who were open about it, saying this is um, uncomfortable, it's not what I expected, um, but it's my history, and I, I, they wanted to know, you know. And tell us about Jewel Barkley and Joan Tribble. Where do they fit into all of this? So Joan Tribble was one of those uh, descendants of the, the Shields slave owner who 
a white woman who lives in Georgia who um, did DNA testing along with others and shared her family stories and kind of helped me on this journey. And Jewel Tribble is the great granddaughter of Dolphus Shields and she too shared her stories and what she knew and her photos. She's and, African -American. and she's African American. And so um, the history is very powerful to me. Um, but how this history reverberates in the lives of people who live today is, is equally powerful to me. And how, how is that? What, what, was, what was the effect on these two women? Uh, you know, it was, it was something that was very powerful for both of them. Uh, Jewel, who knew Dolphus Shields, uh, went to visit him. She lived in Cleveland, uh, was born there, but went to visit in Birmingham, remembered the stories about, the whispers about his white father. Um, and as an older woman in her 80s, wanted to know the truth of her family story. And Joan Triple, the white woman in Georgia, had no idea that uh, there was ever any um, black family connected to her family. Um, but uh, it mattered to her too. I think they were at a time in their lives where some of the things that might uh, prevent other people from digging into this didn't matter to them so much. They, they just really wanted to know. And did they react with uh, anger or remorse or inspiration? I think it was, um, they, they were not surprised because when, um, after the DNA testing, they, they said to me when I told them the results and that they were related and the Black Shields and the White Shields were family, they were both like, well, you've been talking to us for two years, so we figured there must have been something. <laughs> um, but one of the most interesting things that emerged from this book was that in, um, in June, Clayton County, Georgia, where Melvinia lived as a slave, commemorated her life with a, a monument there. And they invited her descendants to come. And at the last moment, I said, well, maybe some of the White Shields would like to come too. And they did. They came from Georgia, some drove from Alabama, and um, they met each other, shared phone numbers, had a meal. I don't know that they'll be Facebook friends for years to come. Um, but it was quite something to see. It really was. Yeah, I imagine so. Uh, it does seem to me that uh, there's a, a greater capacity of a lot of people today to talk about these things uh, in ways that even 10 years ago or 15 years ago uh, would have been more difficult. Uh, and also that um, while white Southerners in particular tend to want to say, well, who knows whether we're related, African Americans almost always believe and have good reason to believe that there are family connections. And, and of course, everyone knew back in 1865. Right, uh, everyone knew. No doubt about it then. Um, Throughout the book, you, uh, you wrestle with the paucity of, of records and, uh, and, and particularly voices and narratives of the many, many characters in the book, uh, which is a, a standard element of all research and scholarship around uh, black life um, because poverty and illiteracy. Um, and so you're also uh, compelled in much of the book to use the subjective sense, um, uh, uh, tense, um, and uh, to talk about what likely was happening or what, what someone might have been thinking. Um, I'm curious to, that that's always a thorny thing for historians. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are about it. Uh, and also just the question of whether the same rules can apply, you know, the, in terms of the expectations of historical scholarship around uh, landed, middle-class, uh, white Americans, the sort of requirements of documentation that exist to that history, can they really be applied in the same way uh, when you're trying to excavate the stories of oppressed and impoverished people? It's a real challenge because, as I mentioned, you know, before the war, uh, African Americans, um, if, if they appeared at all, they appeared in property records, and many of them um, by name, and many of them didn't appear that way at all. Um, they appeared in the census, but just by, with an age and a gender. And people said, oh, well, what about letters and diaries? And, of course, African-Americans were barred by law from reading and writing, so there are no letters, and the newspapers didn't chronicle their births and marriages and uh, celebrations. So it's a real challenge. One of the things that I, I did to try and bring the time to life where I didn't have voices of people was to use contemporaneous um, voices from that time. So um, to get the voices of, she had um, free uh, ancestors, before the Civil War to use the voices of, of, of people who lived around that period um, near, in the area where her family was. Um, and as best I could, I did that. Um, but I think there is inevitably um, 
you know, you, you, want to, you want to wonder. Might she have done this? Maybe she might have done that. We may never know if she had done that, or this, or he, or she. And um, I think that uh, there are things that we simply will not know. And I mean, this is about, this is true whether you're talking about uh, blacks or whites, but particularly true about African Americans because the records simply aren't there. You also uh, might be criticized by some uh, uh, for using the terminology slave. You talk about slaves, you talk about slave masters. Um, there's a conversation in scholarship around these areas today um, that suggests that uh, African Americans who were held in slavery should be called enslaved persons or enslaved people. Uh, uh, and, the, and fairly vigorous debate about that. Uh, I'm just, and I, I just couldn't help but note that you, you went very much with the conventional uh, usage. But is that something you, you, uh, you considered uh, what the, uh, or have a thought on? You know, I didn't. Um, I think I, I, you're right. I used the term slave, slave master, slave owner. I sometimes talked about enslaved people. Um, but I have to confess that um, I didn't wrestle enormously with that terminology. Because it, I, mean, I take it, it, it is what it is. It is what it is. And also, um, yeah, I think it's, it's just how, as a writer, I was just using the language um, as it was. I, I didn't like this. Was, there are many things that I did wrestle with. <laughs> that was not one of them that I, I, I wrestled enormously with. You also uh, deal in various places in the book with what is a very sensitive topic um, for many people, many African Americans in particular, and something that many white people are unaware of, uh, and that is the hierarchy of skin tones among African Americans uh, and, uh, and the important uh, sort of cultural um, uh, impact of that. Um, but, but talk about that and how that applied to these various strands of, of Mrs. Obama's family. You know, historically speaking, the children of slave owners uh, were privileged people. Um, sometimes, even if they were not formally recognized by their white parents, they uh, were educated or given a little land or a little money, something that uh, pushed them a little bit forward. And after the war, you can see that quite visibly. During Reconstruction, uh, many of the uh, African American politicians were people who were very were mixed race. And um, within society, even decades, uh, generations later, those people and their children and grandchildren ended up often having a leg up. In uh, Michelle Obama's family, Dolphus Shields uh, was very fair-skinned. People described him as near white. And he, again, did not talk about his white ancestry, but in some ways you could see how it benefited him. Um, one of the things that I, it took me a long time to figure out, he's, his carpentry shop was in an area of town that was uh, predominantly white business owners. And where was this? Uh, this was in downtown Birmingham. Right. And um, the people who knew him said he was the only black businessman there. And uh, you know he would have white and black customers. And uh, you'd come into his shop, and you know there would be white men sitting and passing the time. And um, this was a time in Birmingham where things were very rigidly segregated. I was able to learn that the, the codes um, were a, a little fluid in terms of the business district, um, but not so fluid for everyone. There was a, another African American whose business was bombed out <laughs> and did not survive there. And I wonder whether the fact that uh, Dolphus Shields was as light as he was that made it a little easier for him to continue in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. And so what does all of this add up to in terms of uh, the, the, the journey of, of these many families that amount to the family of the First Lady. Um, what, what are the lessons that, uh, that we draw from this, this long 150 years of history? What, what, what does it tell us? To me, it shows the connections that we have, um, you know, across racial lines. Um, you know, we often want to divide ourselves up um, into boxes, and we all still do. Um, but we are very connected, even if some of these connections date back to painful chapters in our history. And I think that that's important. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with a, uh, an evergreen chestnut that works for um, uh, every author who visits us. This one comes via Facebook. Uh, we do have an online audience watching live. And Seth Levy in Washington, D.C. asks, 
What was the most surprising thing you found in your research? Oh my goodness, there were so many surprises because I really wasn't sure where exactly this would all lead me. Um, you know, being able to identify um, the First Lady's uh, white ancestors was probably the biggest surprise. I didn't know whether I would, I, like I said, I suspected that the black and white shields were related, but I didn't know whether the DNA testing would show that or not. And, and, and tell us, though, how, tell us a bit of the mechanics of how you got to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when you set out to find those white relatives, um, you had her last name. Did you have anything else? Her, her maiden well, name? Well, we, we knew, we knew um, because of the article that ran, we knew that um, uh, who owned Melvinia. We knew who the White Shields uh, family was. We suspected that it was her owner's son who was the First Lady's great-great-great-grandfather because Melvinia lived uh, alongside him in 1870. She continued to have biracial children after the war. They were close enough in age. And so I started looking for his descendants for DNA testing. And the DNA testing, how, how close did it take you to the identity of, of, of the actual person? Well, you know, it's, DNA testing is great. You know, without it, uh, we would never have been able to find out that the families were, were related. But it's not so precise to be able to say, it's this guy here. Um, what it tells us is that um, these families were related. Um, he was, it, it does indicate that it is likely to be him because uh, the closest descendant to him was the closest match, uh, but we can't say with 100% certainty. And that relationship continued after, the, after her emancipation? Well, we don't, know. she continued to have children after the war, mixed race children after the war. I have not been able to find their descendants, so I'm not sure whether um, the White Shields, someone in the White Shields family was also their father. Um, but um, for members of the family, black and white, it does um, give them a little hope that perhaps there is more to this relationship than just something um, that was born in violence. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm curious as to whether this has sparked a genealogical interest in you, if you're going to do more research in examining other people, yourself, or any other projects. Well, you can't spend all this time digging into someone else's ancestry and not wonder about your own. <laughs> So um, my father is from the South, from North Carolina. My mother is from the Caribbean and the Bahamas. And so I thought, oh, goodness, the uh, Caribbean, that's too hard. But I did do a little digging into my father's family. The First Lady has um, ancestors from North Carolina. The free uh, mixed race uh, line of her family lived on, the, on Virginia and in the North Carolina side of the border. So. I went to Chicago, and I was at the Newberry Library, which is a wonderful uh, resource. And I found a book that had voting registration records from North Carolina from 1867. And I was looking for the First Lady's family and did not find them. But I did find my great, great, great grandfather, who registered to vote in 1867. He was in his 40s, um, you know, just two years after slavery ended. It didn't indicate um, whether he voted or who he voted for, um, but he was approved as a voter, and it's the oldest record I have in my family. Well, your story, and also so much of the First Lady's story, also documents this often misunderstood aspect of the, the African-American arc in American history of this period of great freedom following the Civil War, that it lasts a fairly significant period of time uh, with lots of voting, lots of economic independence, hardship as well, but then the, the withdrawal of all of those things and of civil rights and liberties at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Um, what's your sense, based on the, all the people you have talked to who are uh, in Mrs. Obama's family, your own, what's the significance of that, that there was freedom, freedom was taken away, and then 50 years of struggle to, to reachieve it? I think it was uh, enormously difficult. You know, you had this period of great hope, and I often think of this great, great, great grandfather um, registering to vote and getting approved as a voter and having no idea what the next 20 or 30 years um, would be like for, for his children and grandchildren. Um, in Mrs. Obama's family, that's why I think you see a lot of people moving out of the South. In Chicago, uh, you could vote, and your children could go to integrated schools, and, and that was a life that um, they simply could not enjoy in the South. 
But you also write about in the book the, uh, that after uh, the, the various threads of her family arrive in Chicago, they experience uh, 1919 uh, and some of the very worst things that happened. But, but tell us some of the details of, of, of those experiences for her family. That's right. So people moved north hoping for those things, but um, the north was not always um, the promised land that they'd hoped for. And uh, Phoebe, the First Lady's great-grandmother, uh, lived through the Chicago riots, and that was a, an, a period of enormous disillusionment for a lot of African Americans. And her family, um, they still remember, she actually had many children. Her husband was um, an itinerant um, minister and worked on the railroads and was not there. And she locked the doors and boiled, um, had lye and water boiling on the, on the stove in case someone burst into her home. And um, it was a difficult time. Her family actually left Chicago uh, shortly after that to move to Evanston, Illinois. And it was a period when a lot of African Americans did do that and, and moved out of Chicago. There was a great deal of discouragement then. I'm, in, I'm intrigued as to how you've tracked the slaves without a, for want of a better word, family name, because the wills that I've seen of local plantation owners, all they had on there was the name of the woman or man and value. No, did they acquire the name of the plantation owner in, their, in your tracking then, or how did you get them? Well, as I told you, this uh, book emerged out of an article that I wrote, and the article emerged because a genealogist who had done some work for us uh, early on uh, on an article about actually the president and mostly his rainbow family uh, found Melvinia, and um, it was not easy for her to do that. What she she found Melvinia in the census in 1870 with the Shields family and then traced that Shields family. Sometimes you have to trace the white ancestors back. And she was able to find Melvinia in this uh, planter's uh, will and then to find uh, her again in the census um, living right next door to um, that planter in, in Spartanburg, South Carolina's grandson. And so that's how. It was difficult, though. So for instance, on her father's side, um, the father, um, there's a Cohen family. And um, her great-grandmother on her father's side was Rosella Cohen. And I, there, there was a prominent Jewish family in Georgetown, South Carolina, very, very uh, prominent, um, who they were slave owners, too. And I was able to, through um, Caesar Cohen, uh, join the Union Army. And um, when his wife applied for a pension, uh, they gave some information. And it described, for instance, where they had been enslaved. Um, so that was a remarkable find, because then you knew where to go. Um, I went to the records there. Um, but again, um, you know, I didn't find them listed anywhere by name. So it's, it's a very, very difficult thing. And that also speaks to the, the, to the question we talked about earlier of uh, whether the same rules exactly can apply. I don't know what other rules you use. I mean, we have to rely on the documents. Um, like I said, as, as a writer, in order to bring these periods to life, I, I used um, the voices of people who lived at the time uh, records um, that describe the time. For instance, there's almost nothing about what Melvinia's life was like after slavery in Clayton County, Georgia. Um, but the Freedmen's Bureau records from that county vividly describe, you know, what was happening there. Schoolhouses being burned down. For instance, there were um, white and black families um, listed on ration lists getting support from um, the government. There was a drought. And so I, I had to rely quite extensively on the records surrounding these folks. But I, I don't know. And, and then you can wonder about what happened. But I, I think we do have to rely on what there is and just acknowledge that we might not know. I was intrigued by your statement about the, uh, the, on the poll books finding their names. As you probably know, Virginia had a poll tax that you had to pay in order to register to vote. And I'm wondering about other states. And that poll tax in Virginia stayed until well into 1960s. Um, 
And I'm wondering whether the other states had similar thing that would prevent people from registering to vote, because that was expensive. Oh, yes, that was a very common um, strategy uh, to keep African Americans from voting. Um, it reminds me, though, that in, in Virginia, there were some other sources that were really helpful for that time. For instance, um, families uh, regist registered their marriages or um, their commitments um, in Virginia in these cohabitation records. Um, and those were a, are a wonderful find because they, they registered, there was the first time that African Americans, you know, or, marriages were being recognized by law. And so people lined up and they told, you know, who their their spouses were, who their owners were, the names of all their children, um, whether they had been free or enslaved. And that's a, an amazing document um, because it does allow you a glimpse back uh, before the war. Another question from a Facebook viewer in Washington, D.C. What was your predominant purpose for writing this book, and what is the main point you hope readers will take from it? Is it a story about a powerful First Lady's heritage, or is it instead using a popular contemporary figure to eliminate roots familiar to many Americans? I think it was, in a way, both. Uh, the First Lady is, uh, she's the first African-American First Lady. Um, this is the first African-American family living in this house, this White House, which was built in part by slave labor. I think there's enormous interest in her. Um, but for me, too, the history was enormously interesting. And what I loved about her family was that they were so ordinary, um, black and white. They were farmers and school teachers and sharecroppers and domestics and railroad porters and carpenters um, who made their way um, forward and backward. And I, I think it really reflects um, the story of the country. And to me, that was what was most powerful. What year did Dolphus Shields die? And has uh, Marian Robinson shown an interest in the book? Tell us who Marian Robinson is. Marian Robinson is the First Lady's mother, who lives uh, with her in the White House. Um, Dolphus lived a long life, too. He died in 1950. So again, I was able to find people who knew him um, who are still alive today. Uh, when the article uh, came out in 2009, um, people asked the president's press secretary about, about it and what the family made of it. And uh, he said, oh, well, they found it fascinating. I know that members of her family have really enjoyed it. I briefed her staff uh, along the way and gave them copies of the book. I don't know uh, what the First Lady thinks, um, but I hope she finds it fascinating. Now, the new research that comes from Lynn Margolis and research in psychodynamics indicate the overwhelming importance of mothers in the development of the unconscious of the child between birth and three, before the uh, ministers, rabbis, etc., mullahs get a hold of the child. <laughs> and up to that time, the basic ingredients of the forward capacity of the mind is developed by the mother and the mother's love. And everything in psychoanalysis and in neurophysiology indicates that the mother is the angel of going forward. And uh, uh, I wondered if you would consider writing a book, The Mammalian Tapestry, <laughs> out of Africa from which we all came. <laughs> well, I can certainly say that um, the First Lady stands on the shoulders of some remarkable women and remarkable mothers. You know, Melvinia, in addition um, to being this uh, fascinating figure, was able to reunite uh, with uh, the people she knew on um, the farm in Georgia, uh, where, I'm sorry, in South Carolina, where she had been enslaved, which was enormously difficult. After slavery, people searched and searched, walked, put advertisements in newspapers to try and find um, their family. Um, and, and she was able to find the people that she had grown up with and were torn away from as a child. I mentioned that uh, the First Lady's great-great-grandmother, Mary Moten, um, managed to get to Illinois uh, from a slave state in the 1860s. 
and um, that uh, her great grandmother was able to travel as a as a young woman at a time when women didn't do things like that. Um, out of uh, you know the farming country in southern Illinois to a new life. So I don't know whether I, I'm going to do that book. <laughs> but um, I think the women and the mothers in her family were pretty remarkable. Amen. A, a provocative question. Uh, given the history that, uh, that these families experienced and that descend directly to, uh, to Michelle Obama, so different really from President Obama, where his family background really does not include the, the classic stories of the African American experience and civil rights struggle, uh, but here we have them all uh, with, with Mrs. Obama. Uh, what does that context tell us, if anything, about the sentiments of some African Americans, such as Jeremiah Wright? Well, one thing, the first thing I would say is that we actually have um, some interesting, suggestive, new um, genealogical research about the uh, president's family that suggests that he did have African ancestry on his white mother's side of the family. <laughs> um, Ancestry.com uh, traced his, um, his mother's family back to the 1600s, where they found uh, mixed race um, ancestors. So uh, in fact, even though we often think of the president as not having any roots in slaves, uh, in slavery, um, he may have done had some on, on his white mother's side of the family. <laughs> irony of ironies. Irony of ironies, but um, not a surprise at all, actually, if you know the history. Um, I really don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I mean, in terms of the, uh, uh, I think it's remarkable, certainly in my writing, in my research, uh, that, uh, that every African American family uh, has a history which, if you uh, are able to reveal enough of it, includes these stories of the, mm -hmm. the riots of 1919, the riots right. in Springfield, uh, uh, Illinois, 1906, you know, the terrible events in the South, the poll taxes oh, in all okay. these states. Are you saying, I mean, I, I do think that, I mean, if you were speaking of, um, Jeremiah Wright in the, uh, there was obviously a lot of um, uh, coverage about his comments, um, in particular comments he made about the country that were deemed unpatriotic. I think that um, for many African Americans, um, that debate and that coverage seemed um, a bit naive because uh, we all know men of that generation um, who experienced um, enormous, uh, enormous, enormous, enormous difficulties and, um, and their parents and grandparents. And so uh, while we might not agree with those sentiments, I think we understand and they are not unfamiliar to us. Alex Haley was uh, writing Roots and the movies were, the videos were coming. You were a child probably at that time. My children were watching it during that particular period. It gave a rise to the concept of identity. Uh, we had Malefia Sante who was writing uh, books about this at this particular time. Did this have any kind of uh, influence on you as you became interested in these topics? I, I do vividly remember watching Roots and in fact, um, the first lady and her brother also vividly remember watching it together with their parents. Um, I've always been, I think in many families, there's always someone who's interested in family history, it's someone who's always kind of collecting stuff. I've always been that person. Um, I don't know that Roots um, did that for me. I've just always been interested. Um, and I think um, what's fascinating now is that there are so many tools that uh, make it easier for us. I mean, so many people are making these kinds of discoveries about their own families, you know, from their desktops doing cheek swabs. Um, so I think there's a bit of um, a modern day genealogy craze with all these who do you think you are, these television shows, uh, uh, Skip Gates's program on PBS. So I think a lot of us are doing this kind of digging. Do you feel like the, uh, uh, th this topic of uh, biracial uh, relationships and biracial histories and the suggestion that anyone in this room might well be biracial in some sense or multiracial in some sense, uh, the, the likelihood even of that, uh, 
these were all things that a uh, blink of an eye ago were completely taboo in American culture. To have suggested that about anyone in this room 10 or 15 years ago would have been viewed as, a, as an affront almost, uh, uh, a dirty topic, an unspeakable thing. Uh, but that seems to have profoundly changed. I think it is changing. Um, you know, there were um, members of um, the First Lady's distant cousins who said uh, to me, oh my goodness, Grandpa would be rolling in his grave about this kind of conversation. <laughs> so I think there is still some of that. At the same time, you know, we're in an era where, you know, on the census you can check as many boxes as you like. Um, so, <laughs> so things are changing. But again, even so, you know, the president who is biracial chose to check just one. So I think it's, uh, we're in a period of, of transition and people are wrestling with these labels and who we are. An issue that comes up often, you, you deal with it in your book, there's been a question about it, it comes up in the uh, other histories that relate to, to biracial relationships from this period of time involving historical figures, uh, and that is the question of whether, uh, whether it's possible that these relationships, as some of the family members of Melvinia, the descendants of Melvinia suge suggest might be the case, was it possible for there to have been non-exploitative versions of those relationships? It's one of the things that was, has been hardest uh, for uh, members of the First Lady's family, this question of what happened to Melvinia, for the white uh, descendants, um, who, some of whom you know, knew um, of these figures in their families. These were people who they knew as um, hardworking, um, honorable men. And the idea that um, someone could have preyed on or brutalized um, a teenage girl is something that is hard for people um, to uh, to deal with. Um, you know, it's. I think people um, definitely hope because she does have these children after the war who are mixed race that perhaps this was um, not just rape; that there is more there. Um, the truth is that um, we'll never know, and that rape was very, very common um, during that time. And um, I think you could look at uh, Melvinia and say, okay, she stayed after the war. She didn't move. She continued to have these children. Dolphus Shields um, ended up with a trade which carried his family much farther and carried him much farther than some of her other children. Perhaps that white father helped in that way. On the other hand, uh, there are white members of the family who will also look at it another way. She, after the war, she was a, a young woman with four children at a time of enormous hardship. Um, you know, we know about victims of domestic violence who can leave and do not. Uh, was she too afraid to leave? Uh, did he help support her family? And was that why she stayed? Um, we, we will never know. You write about in the book the, uh, the resolving nature of the conclusive DNA test between Joan Tribble and, and Jewel Barclay, the black woman and white woman. Uh, but you also talk about uh, questions like the ones you were just saying that will remain unsolved and can never be solved. Do you find yourself thinking about this story and those plaguing mysteries? Do those questions, uh, do you carry them around with you? Do you wonder about how you'll, you might yet solve them? Uh, are, are, you, are you satisfied with this? I think, you know, of course I wonder. I, I, um, I, I do think that there is, um, I think there are more records out there, there are more stories out there. Um, but in a way, it's just real, isn't it? You know, there are some things in lives that we won't know. And um, our own lives and our, um, even our history, what we, um, what we know, our country's history, there are things we will never know. So I'm, I'm comfortable with the gray and the ambiguity because I think it's, it's real. It's, um, it's the way life is. You wrote the book, a writer's question, uh, you, you wrote the book in somewhat reverse order, not exactly reverse, but uh, you told the accounts of a number of the individual families and, uh, and how they made it, to the, made it to the North. You brought them into the, into the, pre into the, the more recent era, uh, and then you stopped and went back to the very beginning and told the, civil, the story of the Civil War and emancipation. Um, I just wonder, uh, what was your thinking behind the, the structure of the book itself? Um, what I did basically was tell the story backward. And so I tell the story of the most recent, her grandparents' generation, 
<coughs> and great grandparents and then take you back step by step. Um, I thought uh, that there was, uh, I love mysteries, I thought that there was a mystery here and um, that that would be uh, an interesting narrative. We all know where the first lady's story ends up in the White House, but we didn't know where her story began. And in a lot of ways, we don't know in our own lives kind of where our own stories began. Um, and I thought uh, bringing you back that way um, would be more interesting. And also I thought it would bring um, having the uh, more modern day relatives grappling with this history would also lend you a sense of connection to it. And I think we do have these connections to it. What's your assessment of, uh, of the state of political journalism and today and how uh, the, the uh, tapestry of books uh, that have come out over the last couple of years, particularly about the president, uh, we have your, uh, your, your biography of the ancestry of the First Lady, we have a biography of the president's mother, a biography of the president's father, bi multiple biographies of the president, some of them objective, some of them polemical. Uh, you're a rarity in that your book grows out of a very important newspaper article that, that came at the beginning. Uh, but it seems that, uh, by my reckoning at least, that, uh, that so much of the really serious, thoughtful, multi-layered uh, examination of the president and presidential figures uh, is coming from books rather than through daily journalism. But what's, what's your, state, your, your view on the, on the state of political journalism and the other books uh, that have come out in the same vicinity? I think that, you know, uh, as an industry, the journalism industry is in um, very difficult times, uh, particularly newspapers, but the entire industry, we're shrinking. Um, there's less interest in um, dispassionate uh, fact-finding and research. There's much more interest in commentary and opinion. And as a practical matter, um, newspapers and TV and radio stations simply aren't covering Washington and politics in the same way that they did. They simply, a lot of newspapers don't do it at all. Um, there are many regional papers that used to have Washington bureaus that no longer do. We are all of us dealing uh, with smaller staffs, and I think that that inevitably affects uh, the coverage. Um, you know, for, for and I, I was not obviously writing a political book, but I think for um, journalists, um, these books sometimes are at least the ones that are um, really digging into um, the substance of uh, a politician or president. Um, it's a way um, to do what many of us can't do so much anymore in newspapers. And after, uh, after the Obama administration <laughs> ends, whether that's in a very short period of time or in a much longer period of time, uh, and you finally have the sit-down meeting with Mrs. Obama uh, to, to uh, finally over tea or whatever it may be uh, to talk about all of this. Uh, what's the thing you most want to know from her? I would love to know. Um, I would love to know what uh, her mother knew. Actually, I would really. I would love to sit down with uh, Mrs. Obama, but I would really love to sit down with her mother. Um, Dolphus's son, um, Robert Lee Shields who was um, uh, the First Lady's mother's grandfather, vanishes from the records. I, I'd love to know. I think he died. His wife, I know he died. I mean, his wife is described as a widow later on. But I just wonder, what did she know? Um, I've heard that they, you know, like many of us, um, the family had these old photos of, you know, ancestors who uh, you know, you don't, after a while you inherit your grandmother's old photo album and you have no idea who these people are. And the Dolphus Shields was among, um, a they had a photo of him. And I'd love to know, did she hear stories about him? I'd love to sit down with her mother. And what from all of this, if anything, um, do you see in the woman and the first lady that Mrs. Obama is today? And having covered her, ask the first lady, What's your assessment uh, of the job she has done in the White House? Oh, you know, people always, it's, it's a, such a hard question. You know, I focused so much on her ancestors, and people say, oh, well, what kinds of traits carry over? 
You know, I, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really hard uh, question to answer, particularly because even though I covered her, I must confess, I don't know the First Lady that well. <laughs> Um, but, you know, she, um, in her current role, has been one of the most popular figures in the Obama administration. Um, during the uh, last round of uh, congressional elections, uh, Democrats were, were vying for her to come down and stump for them. Um, and she has been quite active and quite busy. I mean, I think there have been, among um, uh, women, uh, some debate about whether she could be uh, more upfront with um, some of her um, interests aside from her mom in chief role. Um, there's uh, some uh, female commentators have said, you know, she's kind of, she's a Harvard educated lawyer after all, she was a hospital executive, she never talks very much about that. Um, but I think uh, she has ended up being one of the most popular surrogates for the president. Thank you. Thank you.